Hope Church. I am Kara McMorris, associate pastor here at Hope, and I am being joined by a couple of friends. Dave, why don't you come up here too? <laughs> Anna and Van are helping me preach today. I'm not sure if it'll be more comfortable for everyone with a little nerves to have you sit in with them, so we'll play that by ear. <laughs> so we have been um, <laughs> preaching on hope at the movies. And we always like to um, have a kid's movie in there because although there is so much depth in so many movies, it's amazing when you watch a child's movie as an adult, you're like, oh, there's some big stuff going on there too. <laughs> and sometimes it is only through the eyes of children, through that faith like a child, that we can take in those messages, that they can reach us in ways that they can't otherwise. And so we're going to hear a little bit about the movie from them. But first, we are going to start with an interview that um, took place earlier in the week by a very important uh, person to us. So let's hear from this important person on video what he had to say about the movie. Today we're talking to Lex about Toy Story 4. Lex, what was your favorite part of the movie? Well, existential crisis of Woody and Porky see particularly consequential in terms of the short-term versus long-term relational anecdotal probabilities. What? Uh, Porky? Why do you like, why do you like Porky so much? He's so innocent like me. Buddy, really? I like Porky. Yeah. Dave, can you keep a secret? Well, yeah, I, I think I can. What's what's the deal? I don't think I like the Cubs. <gasps> That's going to be a problem because your mommy, one mommy loves the Cubs and one mommy loves the Cardinals. I know. I think I love the Cardinals. Well, of course you do, buddy. But let's just keep that between us, okay? All right? I like Forky. Of course you do, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lennox, for that exclusive interview. Appreciate it. So, unfortunately, we started with five people, <laughs> interviewers, and evidently I should have channeled more of my Oprah interviewing skills instead of my Ron Burgundy. Uh, I guess I scared three <laughs> off. So, let's see. We'll get some cutting-edge questions from these uh, these fine young people here. So let's sit down. Tell me a little bit about Toy Story. Can you tell me, tell us all a little bit about Toy Story 4? Well, what I like is that, well, when when Forky and um, um, Woody get lost, um, Forky wants to go back to his kid, but because Woody hopes um, Forky to really, I, um, to see that um, he's the most important toy to um, Bonnie right now. Let's cue an awe. Uh, uh, <laughs> how many people have seen the movie so far? All right, the rest of you need to go out this afternoon and see this movie. Okay. All right. Um, do you have anything to share about what, what happened in the movie? Okay, yes, I agree. I totally agree with what you just said, yes. Um, what, was your, can you, what was your favorite part of the movie? I love that part, too. <laughs> I think you might not have heard that. It was an amazing response, amazing. It's okay. It's all right. Um, can, can you uh, do, what did Forky do? Well... Well, the funny part of the movie is when he's on the bed, and then he's like, I'm trash. That is true. He did it. Can you get up and show what he jumped off the, stand up on the chair there and show, do your best, impre best impression of Forky <laughs> when he was, like, doing that. Can I do, can I do off the stage? Off the stage. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Yes, of, of course you can do off the stage. It's, it's well worth it. Go ahead. Yes. It's fine. There we go. There we go. And he would always say, I'm trash. I'm trash. Can you do your best I'm trash impression? I'm, I'm trash. I'm trash. 
Yes, you did. That's amazing. Amazing. So, was there a bad or a mean toy in the movie? Was there a bad or a mean, was there a bad or mean toy? Not really, because, well, Bonnie already had some toys, and then, and then Bonnie's toys just, n there was just no mean toys. No. There were some misunderstood toys that in the end we found out that they weren't mean at all. Very good, very good. Um, did the, uh, have you ever felt scared or sad about change? Because there's a lot of change in this movie. All right, okay. It's all right. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. Um, scared of like chewing your hair and something like, you know, come at, no. Um, have you ever been scared or anything, buddy? Well, no, because. No, I've never. <laughs> Sometimes I've been scared, just not that much, though. Okay. <laughs> It's going really, really well. I'm sure the ratings will be sky high. Anyway, what did you learn? Did you learn, what did you, what did you learn from the movie? I mean, there's so many lessons that Kara will share in a moment, but what are your perspective on something you learned in the movie? Yes. What I learned is if a friend's feeling sad, doesn't matter um, if they're if they were mean to you just like once or twice. You you should just still help them. Yeah. Ah. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. Exactly right. Exactly right. Um. Where did you see something that reminded you of God in the movie? Let's pull a little God into the movie. Did you did you see anything that reminded you of God? At the end, when Woody chose um. Um, bow over his friends because he 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 wanted to be he wanted to be with Bo, so he was really happy and and he jumped to Bo. Tears, tears. <laughs> this was a big moment. All right. Um. So wrapping up, let's uh let's give a little round of applause to our people here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You guys can go on back and sit down. Thank you so much. Anna and Van, thank yes. you so much. It is so hard. You did an amazing, amazing job. Thank you for your help. Because when we come up here and we are telling people all about God and we're telling people about our experiences, it's much easier when it's just us sitting there with one other person, right? But all these people looking at you. Can I tell you something, Anna, about these people out here? Every single person sitting out here loves you so much and is so, so proud of you to have the courage to come up here. I am so proud of you. Do you want to go down and sit with Dad now? Yeah. Are you ready? You want to stand here? All right. You want to stand next to me? You can join me. You're going to keep helping me? That works for me. Can we move this over here? She wants to be up here, just not talk, evidently. That's cool. We can do that. So Toy Story 4 is one of those movies that everyone said was kind of unnecessary, right? They wrapped it up pretty nicely with Toy Story 3. It could have ended there, but it didn't. And they ended up making it weave in so beautifully. And after I saw it, I thought, oh, that was needed. I needed that for my heart. I needed this um, to be wrapped up in this new way. Because we saw Bo Peep started her life as a lamp that was on um, little Molly's table. So Andy is the character that had Woody, um, and his baby sister Molly was born, and then Bo was this delicate porcelain lamp that when little Molly would cry at night, this lamp was the only thing that would help her to stop crying. And it was uh, porcelain, so not something that could do that rough and tumble play. Um, and as the lamp uh, shade spun, it made a beautiful, beautiful stars on the ceiling. And so this is how Bo Peep started her life. But there came a time, as we see in Toy Story 4, that Molly was older and no longer needed this lamp to keep her feeling safe at night. And so the lamp is put in this box, and <clears throat> Bo Peep is ready for whatever comes next. She is scared, kind of like the kids coming up here, scared but doing it anyway. She says to Woody, don't, 
rescue me from this box, let me go for whatever it is that's going to come next. And Woody has a, a chance there where he could jump in the box with her and go on to whatever's next, but he's not ready. He's holding out hope that he can once again be a beloved toy. Woody was clinging to his past. He was sure that if he just tried harder, if he just did something a little bit different, if he could just figure out the secret, that it would be easier. It would go back to how it used to be, and he could once again have his purpose in life. So what he did in this new life, so Andy has gone off to college. He ended up in a box of hand-me-down toys that had a stint in a daycare center. And then um, Woody was taken from that box to her uh, little girl's house named Bonnie. So currently, Woody is one of Bonnie's toys that hangs out in the closet and has gotten the dreaded thing that toys get when they're not played with very often, dust bunnies. And so he has dust bunnies that start to cling to him, and that is the first sign of being a not very played with toy. Well, Bo Peep was able to trust what came next, to take a step into the unknown, this next season of life, Woody just couldn't possibly imagine his life in any other way, being anything other than a cherished toy. Woody was certain that the only thing that could possibly give meaning to his life was being loved and deeply needed by a child. And still, after three movies of this already, we find Woody in the same place of saying, I just didn't think, I don't remember it being this hard. It shouldn't be this hard. And isn't it like that in our lives sometimes, that we just keep trying to do the same thing over and over and over again, thinking it shouldn't be this hard? And then it turns out maybe there's something else for us that we might be able to enjoy in life. Because Woody had this thing that he was certain of, and though everything else in his life had changed, he believed with his whole heart that this was the only path that he could take, that everything was eventually going to fall back into place. And then there's Forky, who Van demonstrated. Forky's uh, <laughs> signature move was jumping, usually into the trash, because Forky was a spork. And when Bonnie went to her first day of kindergarten orientation, uh, there was a little mix-up with some stuff that was taken out of the garbage, and this spork, who was meant, intended, his purpose in life was simply to eat a snack, eat a lunch, and then be thrown away. That was all, that's all we use our sporks for normally. And yet, Bonnie saw more in Forky than trash, and Bonnie took Forky out of the garbage and made him into a cherished, beloved toy. And that hallmark thing about knowing when, a when something is a cherished toy is she wrote her name on the bottom of his feet, just as Andy had done to his cowboy, Woody. Forky was living Woody's dream, and Forky didn't understand it. It kept jumping in the trash. Forky was certain of his purpose just as Woody was. Woody did not understand how Forky was not jumping at this chance to be a cherished toy and was always trying to escape from that. But they had different purposes that they were each struggling to find. Both Forky and Woody resisted the change that was taking place in their life and trying to get back to the only thing they knew that could help them find peace. And for them, it was the way that things used to be. Change is hard for all of us. And it's not just hard because we're scared. It's not just hard because we don't like it. But we're actually hardwired to resist change. There was a point in humankind where we had to be, and not us personally, but humans had to be on the lookout for lions and tigers and bears to come and attack them at any moment, right? So we have been hardwired for this fight or flight. We have been hardwired for survival to be our number one goal. And so when things change, when we sense uncertainty, it can be so hard for us. Survival often means finding what works 
and sticking to it. And so the fact that this happens doesn't make us unique or different than any other, but just exactly who we were created to be. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately for things changing, we have evolved. And our goal now is not only to survive, but to sometimes... And sometimes that's all we can do. That's the best we can do is survive, but we are also given the ability to thrive, to find joy, and to be at peace. We don't have to hold so tightly anymore because in most of our lives, at least mine, uh, there's not lions and tigers and bears attacking me as I try to sit down and have a meal. Anyone? You guys surprised me last week with something, so some of you still have that fear sometimes. I get it. That biology, that neurology is still in us from the Stone Age. Changing our behaviors is absolutely one of the hardest things we'll ever attempt in life, and changing our mindset is even harder than changing our behaviors. Woody acted like he was okay being stuck in a closet. He still wore that sheriff's badge with pride, and he still scurried around and tried to tell all the other toys what to do like he was the one in charge when really Dolly had to keep putting him in his place and saying, no, I have more seniority than you in this place. You're new here. He could pretend that he was okay being a seldom played with toy, but changing his perspective, his thinking, was not as easy. It took him out of his comfort zone and it caused him great anxiety. Neurologists give several reasons why we are so resistant to change. The first one is that negative emotions are horrible fuel. Oftentimes we think, whether it's with children or with our friends or with um, those we love or even with ourselves, that if I just make myself feel bad enough about this thing I'm doing, we shame ourselves or we shame others, that that will motivate change, right? It seems logical to us, even with my dog. When we first got our dog, it's funny, I've started preaching about my dog almost every week now. <laughs> when we first got her, we thought, oh, if we hit her when we, she takes something she's not supposed to or we punish her, all that did was make her aggressive and resistant. But when we used positive reinforcements, it was much better. It led us to peace and joy, and unity together. Negativity is the worst fuel for change that we could ever possibly use. We need to be going towards something and not away from something because we need to keep that motivation through our change. Number two, reason why uh, change is so difficult, all or nothing thinking is a no-win situation. We get trapped in these fallacies that if I can't, whatever it is, if I can't get this job that I want, if I can't lose X amount of pounds, if I can't uh, reach this goal of being uh, a major league baseball player, whatever it is, then I shouldn't even bother. And these are lies. This is illogical and not true. For if we want to make change, we take small steps. Anyone who has ever experienced change, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen at the snap of a finger, but it's something that we have to go through. If we think, if we believe these fallacies, it is a no-win situation. We get absolutely nowhere. Number three, to create change, we must make small steps with the right shoes. Understanding that behavior change is huge, that it is these small steps that lead to big change, we sometimes underestimate the power of the tools that we need for that change to happen. If you've ever tried to run in snow boots or run in flip-flops, I keep doing this and thinking I can run in flip-flops and I always trip. Am I alone in that one? Sorry. If you've ever tried to swim in baggy clothes or do anything once you've gotten wet, uh, you know, from, drenched from rain, we need tools, the right tools. If we're running, we need shoes for running. If we're swimming, we need clothes for swimming. If we are going to change our diet, then we must have a knowledge about health. 
If we are going to start exercising, we must know what we can do and what is actually going to help us reach our goals for that specific thing. If you are going to get a new job, then you need the resume and the skills. Every change that we try to make, there are certain tools that we need. And if it is a, a change that we want to make um, to find our worth, like Forky needed, Forky needed a community to come around and say, let us tell you who you are. When those lies and that negativity are coming so quickly into your brain, the community of toys came around Forky and said, let us tell you who you are. It doesn't matter who you were. It doesn't matter what you were or where you were. Let us tell you who you are now and to us and in this place. We must know what our tools are and use them to help us be successful in change. And number four, change is absolutely a process. Change is not one decision or one thing, but it is many connected things all working together. And when we continue to strive towards one thing, thinking this is the change I need to make, and we ignore all the interconnectedness of the rest of life, we end up like Forky saying, it shouldn't be this hard. We are also all in different stages of this process. So if I have a goal and I look at someone else and say, that is something that I want to work towards. I can compare myself to that person or that situation and say, I just want to get there. And we see this in Bo Peep as she is trying to encourage Woody, who is just at the beginning of this process. Let's look at that picture of Bo Peep, how he encounters her. So she began as that delicate porcelain lamp with this big, beautiful skirt. And then she had to find her way. Her arm broke. Her staff broke. She had to change her costume so that she could go through this change in her life. Her purpose was no longer to stand there and be Bonnie's nightlight. But she found purpose. There's this phrase of being a dreaded lost toy. And all the toys originally in Woody and in Bonnie's closet wanted to be anything but a lost toy. Even if they were just stuck in that closet covered in dust bunnies, at least they weren't lost. And then Woody encounters Bo and she says, Woody, I'm not the one who's lost here. She went through this process and she found her place and she used her tools and, and she got some bumps and bruises along the way. It wasn't easy for her, but she had taken it step by step and found a new community. And at one point, they stand at the top of this carousel, and Woody's like, but you need to get to be a cherished toy again. And she says, Woody, I have all of this. And she looks at a carnival full of children, and she looks at a park full of children, and she talks about a birthday party down the street. And she and her other toys find children wherever they are that need toys. Instead of being there for that one child that cherishes them and it's safe and it's comfortable, they go out into the world and they find those children that need comfort, those children that don't have toys. Bo isn't a delicate porcelain decoration anymore. And she is the one that can help Woody through this process. In scripture, it says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert. This is in Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophecy. Something told, these words were told long before the change was going to happen, long before God's people needed to hear it. But for those who knew this scripture, for those who knew this prophecy, they had been a little more ready for this change to take place. They were given this promise. Something new is happening here. Don't cling to the past. Don't cling to what you know, but experience what is new here now for you. For I 
For God is with you and God is making a way in the wilderness, putting streams in the desert. There is no doubt in my mind that as Bo was making that transition from being a beloved children's toy to this new creation, she doubted that. But there were things and, and people, children, and other toys to help her along that process. Woody is so scared for Bo. He projects all of his desires and purpose onto Forky, who seems certain that it's his destiny to be trash instead of a beloved toy. Both were believing a false truth that they could only be happy with one certain outcome. That they were wrong. And what if we are too? What if we are wrong with the one thing that we think is the secret? to happiness and peace? What if there's something so much better that we can't even fathom for ourselves based on where we stand? Something new. Scripture says, I am doing a new thing. It's springing up. Do you feel it? I am making a way for you in the wilderness. I am making streams in the desert. After quite a few adventures, Forky gets back to Bonnie and takes his place as her beloved toy, not trash. Woody has taken him to that place of understanding. And Woody stands at a threshold knowing that he can continue to push and prod and struggle to make his life what it once was. But he's different now after what he's experienced, after what he has seen. He's changed, and he must hold on to what he knows for sure more loosely with open hands and, and consider what might be the something new that it's time for. Woody chooses adventure with Bo. He chooses the unknown. He chooses whatever the future might hold for him in the world of toys who are out on their own rather than lost. Those toys that are together in community, finding their purpose as it comes to them day by day, even though it is nothing that they ever would have imagined for themselves back in Toy Story 1 as the beloved toys of Andy. Let us pray. God of all, you have called us on this adventure of being your people. You have begun stories in our lives, and it would be so nice in so many ways if we could just stick on one path, but that is not the life you have called us to, God. You have called us to be bold and courageous. You have called us to see where it is you want us to be in the world, the places that you can use our unique gifts and talents, and to be ready to shine our light in those places. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for being with us along this way, for making a way for us and in those times when we are facing bumps and bruises to lead us to streams in the desert, those moments of encouragement, that community, those people that encourage us and allow us to walk through that change with as much grace as possible. Thank you, God, for being present for continuing to write the story of our lives every day. Amen. Amen.